being here. And I know those that were here as Joyce ministered among you are just, I know it's wonderful to see her. And just to let you know, Joyce, we do have an opening for a part-time pianist, and uh, you're welcome. I can call a business meeting right now and uh, just get you right in. But uh, if not, I'll let you think about it for a day or two, and uh, Willard will be calling. <laughs> it is good to see you. Uh, we are learning this fall uh, about the path to personal and congregational renewal. How do we renew our faith? How do we revive the fire that uh, God wants to put in us so that we can be partners in his ministry? And we've been thinking and dialoguing and praying in prayer groups this fall, and I hope that you're in one. And we've been praying and uh, searching scripture and talking with each other concerning what fresh vision does God have for Fairview Baptist? And in the midst of those prayer groups, we're, we're discovering disciplines, spiritual disciplines that we need to have if renewal is going to take place. And so I'm going back for the rest of this fall and talking about those themes that you have been and will be talking about in your prayer groups. And if you're not in a prayer group, you can take these themes and pray about them personally and for our church in your own way. So this morning, uh, we're going to talk about the spiritual necessity of confession. That renewal and revival just absolutely cannot happen in our life as individual believers in the life of the body of Christ without confession happening first. Now, if we look at Scripture, there are many beautiful passages about confession and about repentance, but probably one of the, the best, I think, is the 51st Psalm. And you can turn to Psalm 51 in your Bible or maybe on your phone or iPad, but it's a beautiful prayer of David that teaches about confession, and it also teaches about the correlation, the relationship of confession and personal renewal. And we want to look at that this morning. Many of us know, or if in your Bibles you have a heading before the 51st Psalm, you'll discover that David writes this psalm after the prophet Nathan confronts him about David's act of, uh, of adultery with Bathsheba and after the fact that he has sent Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, in the front of battle so that he can be killed so that he can legally marry Bathsheba and hide this pregnancy that she has. And as David is confronted by Nathan, he prays for forgiveness from the Lord. So the first part of David's prayer begins with David agreeing that he sinned and uh, his awareness that he sinned against God. So beginning with the third verse, David prays, For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. David reminds us that Sincere confession that leads to renewal is born out most of the time of an awareness that we discover in the midst of the holiness of God versus 
it's not really born out of guilt, and it's not born out of just being caught red-handed doing something wrong. If we confess only out of guilt, normally we get stuck and wallow in that guilt. And guilt just never allows us to move beyond to the future of what God has in store for us. <clears throat> and that's for several reasons. When we confess out of guilt, we remain stuck because, first of all, we dwell on our past failures. We never move beyond regretting what we've done. Uh, we never move beyond thinking we can overcome what we failed at. And I know in my life, many, many times, it's something that I have done or a sin I committed, something I said, something I'm ashamed about, a movie from my past that goes on in my mind that reoccurs from time to time. And I say to myself again, why did I do that? Why did I say that? I wish I had that day over, those moments over. I must have looked like an idiot when I, in those moments. Gosh, I, I just, all right, now I can just feel the embarrassment 30 years later of that time. Have you ever done that? Just ruminate about these terrible moments of your life. And that's guilt. That's guilt. And guilt keeps us focusing on ourselves and how we can correct our own mistakes, how we can ever get over these things. And it, it just leaves us with this hopeless feeling because we discover time and time again we can't get over it ourselves. We can't, these memories cannot leave us on our own. And we have to come back to the reality that God can forgive. That if you prayed, even 30 years ago, for something you still regret, if you prayed and asked for forgiveness, the Bible says God has already forgotten that. He has forgotten that for these 30 years. He'll forget it for eternity. He puts that sin into the deepest ocean as far as the east is from the west. He forgets about it. He's not thinking about it. He's not looking down 30 years later and saying, Hey, Jim, uh, I want to put this in your mind. I really want you to remember you know, how stupid you are and feel bad about this again. God's forgotten about it. But boy, is it hard for us to forget about it, isn't it? It's tough. It's tough. Confessing also only because we've been caught red-handed stems from a selfish posture, doesn't it? Uh, confessing because we've gotten caught, and sometimes we say we're sorry, but it's sometimes like us saying, well, you got me this time, forgive me, but I've learned I know how to get away with it next time. Right? You know, yeah, you got me this time, Forgive me. Don't give me the consequences. But I sure learned I'm not going to get caught doing that again. I might do it again, but you're not going to catch me. If I confess out of being caught red-handed in something, many times I have the attitude that if I confess, then I can avoid the immediate consequences of that sin. You know, if I confess, maybe it'll, the sentence will be a little lighter. You know, I think our children have tried to pull this on us through the years, right? You know, we think one of the reasons we're wise to it is because we do it too, in bigger ways. But, you know, the, you know, your child really makes a mess. They really go and, and, and touch that vase that you told them not to touch, and it breaks. And, and uh, man, they can well up with the big tears. And, and cry and come across just, I'm so sorry, I'll never do that again. I'll never run through the house again. 
You know, I'll never play where I'm not supposed to play again. Just don't bring out the punishment that you usually give me. But they're going to run through the house again. They're going to play and frolic again. But they've been caught red-handed, and they're going to try to get out of it at the moment, aren't they? That's confessing because we're caught. It's like our jury system. We, we plead guilty so the judge will give us a lesser sentence. Well, that may work for the justice system, but it's really not repentance in God's eyes. It's not what God is looking for. But the beginning of true confession is when we discover ourselves in the very presence of the Holy God, and we become acutely aware that compared to him, we're sinners. And we cannot do anything but pray to the grace of God to take care of that. David is made aware with Nathan's great parable of how even though he's the king of all of Israel, he doesn't compare to the holiness of God. And his sin with Bathsheba and against Uriah is one that runs very deep, and he needs forgiveness. You remember the call of Isaiah in the sixth chapter of Isaiah? Isaiah's at a funeral for King Uzziah, and he, he glances into the temple, and with the incense and everything, he, he sees the temple filled with smoke, and then it's holy smoke, and he gets a, a vision of the throne of God with the seraphim, and and he, he's so convicted of the holiness of God, he, he imagines that um, the seraphim taking that coal from the altar and flying it over and dropping it on his tongue because he's so sinful. And he confesses. That's deep confession, isn't it? That's deep confession. Craig being here reminded me of our teenage years. <clears throat> he will not tell you anything. So don't don't ask him. Yeah, he says for money. That's that's Craig. But uh, we used to do summer missions. One of the things we did every summer was take the school for the deaf and blind, take kids and, and adults on a weekend retreat to Camp Piankate. And we'd play softball with them and archery and teach them to scuba dive in the swimming pool and um, sail and canoe. And they had a great time. And in the evening, we'd have a campfire worship. And one of my other good friends, Jim Ayler, years ago was leading the campfire worship. And it was one of the many, most meaningful moments of confession and how we can really begin to feel forgiven and renewed. And he made this uh, awkward cross out of a couple of big pieces of wood. And at the end of his devotional about the cross, he gave us all little pieces of paper, um, impaired and counselors, and he said, write down a sin, write down something you're struggling with, write down something you can't get over on this piece of paper. It can be anything. If you don't want to really write it, you know, take this nail and pretend you're writing it. So we all wrote down something or pretended, and we, we nailed it to this, this old uh, rugged type cross, and he took those, and he talked about how God can forgive sin, and then he just took the cross and laid it in the fire. And all those pieces of paper with all those sins on it just burned up to ashes and were gone. And he said, that's like our soul, our being, when God forgives us. The sins are gone. Feel free. Feel alive. Feel like they're gone forever. That's confession and the results. And so confession brings us to the spiritual truth that only God can forgive. Only God can recreate a new heart. Only God can recreate a new purpose within our hearts. David goes on to say in, in verse 7, Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. 
Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. So confession is not just being sorry. It's not trying to relieve ourselves from guilty feelings. It's not bargaining with God. It's not attempting even to avoid eternal punishment forever. Confession comes from this awestruck and grateful heart that seeks the grace of God. And confession is, is moving away from a pattern, a pattern of self-destructiveness towards a life of faith, living for Jesus. It's moving not just away from something, but towards something. It's moving towards a new hope. It's moving towards a new direction. It's moving towards a new purpose that comes from a fresh start from God when he forgives us. Confession is literally making a U-turn in our life. It's agreeing and saying to God that our way is not his way. It's committing to change our patterns in our life and to follow the path that God has blazed for us through Jesus Christ. It's newness. It's turning around and trying not to live that old life again. And we realize we are truly confessing when we present our true selves to God. You know you're truly in confession when you're having an honest conversation with the Lord. You know, we have a lot of dishonest conversations with each other, don't we? We tell each other kind of what we want each other to know, but we hold back some stuff. We don't, we don't bear our whole soul with everybody, maybe even our closest friends. But in confession, we can be brutally honest with God. Because God knows if we're not, right? Why hold it back from God? And you know your faith in God is, is getting stronger and, and you're ready to trust in God fully. Like Miriam said, it takes sometimes it takes a year for some of these refugees to really figure out what it means to know Jesus and follow him. But you know you're ready when you're having that open, honest, pure conversation with God and say, here I am, Lord. And God says, I accept you. Just as you are, asking for forgiveness. Thank you for being honest. Thank you for sharing your soul. It's from this <clears throat> posture of forgiveness when our hearts are finally cleansed. That's when revival occurs. That's when renewal happens. And we can't really receive a fresh vision from God for ourselves or for our church until we've had that forgiveness from true confession. David knew it. He goes on in verse 13 after he um, asks for forgiveness. He says, then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are God my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. It's the realization of being clean, forgiven, that motivates us towards having a new future. Whether this morning you need a new future in your own life, you need to come out of whatever you're working on now, dealing with now, and need a new beginning, or whether a church is looking for a new beginning and a new vision and a new purpose that God has for it. We have to come with a forgiven heart. 
and a forgiven person, when we're truly forgiven, that's when we desire and yearn for others to experience the forgiveness that Christ has given us, isn't it? Don't you want everybody else to know the cleanliness of heart that you have of being forgiven? If you truly experience that forgiveness, you can't help but tell somebody else about it. Because you want everybody to know. And so it's personal confession, it's corporate confession that will motivate us as individuals and as a congregation to be Great Commission believers, to be mission-focused in our life and mission-focused as a body of Christ at Fairview. May we begin with confessing this hour. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your word. Um, your word penetrates sometimes. It, uh, it convicts. Lord, may we have courage to be honest with you, lay open to you our life, that we may know true forgiveness as we repent our sin. In your name we pray. Amen.